Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Austin Schlick. I'm the FCC General Counsel. Um, we are here to discuss the new rules relating to ex parte procedures and uh, filing and docketing procedures that the Commission recently adopted. Uh, I think a, a distinctive and, and possibly unique feature of the FCC's processes is the openness of our uh, of our process, our, our rulemaking processes. We are overwhelmingly rulemaking agency and we have a lot of contact with the public in the course of that. And some of that uh, contact is, is quite informal. I, uh, I've been talking with, uh, with one of our panelists about why this might be so and uh, I have a theory which is that this agency uh, developed uh, and came of age at a time where you had the Bell system on the telecommunications side where you had radio and television networks on the media side. Uh, we had uh, very important stakeholders, repeat players, uh, an ongoing uh, mutually supportive relationship with it, with those and it may be a vestige of that, I don't know. But uh, for whatever reason, uh, our processes have always been particularly open and the challenge over the years has been to make them transparent as well. Uh, that is, uh, the accessibility we believe, and, and the agency has come to believe, should be matched by the public's ability to know what is being said uh, in those meetings between industry, the public, and decision makers. Um, beginning in 1980, really urged by the D.C. Circuit, the Commission adopted a set of ex parte rules that require greater or lesser, depending on the, uh, the proceeding, uh, disclosure of ex parte contacts. And Julie will explain what ex parte contacts are for those of you uh, who aren't familiar with the definition. Um, generally, the trend has been to increase the reporting obligations uh, for ex parte contacts. The last substantial rewrite of the ex parte rules was in 1997. Um, last February, the Commission adopted and uh, last week the Federal Register published a new set of amendments to the ex parte rules that continue that, that process of increasing transparency and increasing the reporting obligations. At the same time the Commission adopted and the Federal Register last week published and on June 1st uh, uh, the rules will take effect, a set of uh, rules for docketing and electronic filing, the point of which is to get the information that we require to be provided online and available to the public so that it can be easily submitted by practitioners and easily accessed by those who are interested. Uh, the idea being that anyone who wants to know what's going on in our proceedings should be able to find out accurate information, uh, informative uh, information, and uh, yeah, should be able to do it quickly. Um, today we're going to start with a presentation by Julie Veach who is Deputy General Counsel on the new ex parte rules. Uh, Bill Klein is going to follow that with a presentation on the transparency and, uh, and uh, docketing requirements. Bill is Associate Bureau Chief for Consumer Information in our Consumer and Government Affairs Bureau. Uh, and then we're going to hear from two leading practitioners, uh, David Solomon and Howard Weiss, uh, who are going to lead a question and answer session and take your questions. So let's begin with Julie, please. Thank you, Austin, and good, after, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for being here. I know you feel just as passionately about the FCC's ex parte procedures as I do, given that you're here on an absolutely gorgeous Friday afternoon. Um, as Austin said, I'd like to go over uh, the new ex parte rules. Um, then Bill will launch into a discussion of some of the procedural reforms that the Commission is also undertaking. These, these orders really are of a piece in that they are both aimed at creating greater transparency and efficiency in the Commission's processes, both for the, the benefit of the public and the participants in our proceedings, as well as for our own Commission staff who need access to information and records. So the ex parte reforms. Um, I know many of you are familiar with our existing ex parte rules, so I've set up the presentation as sort of a compare and contrast, but I don't want to assume that everyone is familiar with them. So uh, in, in case you are unfamiliar or need a refresher, 
Um, an ex parte presentation is a communication related to the merits of a proceeding made without advance notice to the parties and an opportunity for them to be present. In, in the reforms, we focus on reforms to notices regarding oral ex parte presentations in permit but disclosed proceedings. Um, there are a few of our rules that apply to other types of proceedings, but the thrust is um, changes in our uh, disclosure requirements in permit but disclosed proceedings. The first reform, and perhaps the most uh, significant, is that once the rules go into effect, all oral ex parte presentations will require notice. For those who are familiar with the old rule, the old rule says the person making an oral ex parte presentation must file a notice, but only if the presentation contained new data or arguments not already reflected in that person's written filings. When the new rule goes into effect, a person who makes any oral ex parte presentation must always file an ex parte notice um, for each meeting, uh, for each proceeding, it's an always. In addition, the ex parte notices that must always be filed must contain additional information. Under the old rule, it was satisfactory to summarize any new data or arguments not already reflected in the presenter's written filings in the proceeding. And that was, only, that was required only if an ex parte had to be filed at all. Under the new rule, an ex parte notice must contain a list of all persons attending, both uh, outside presenters and uh, internal FCC staff, and it must contain a summary of all data presented and arguments made, not just new data and arguments. With regard, though, to data or arguments that are already in the person's written filings in that docket and maybe some in their comments or a prior ex parte filing, citations to those filings are acceptable. So you don't have to repeat in every ex parte notice the full argument or all go through all of the data. It's acceptable to cite back to prior filings. And now we turn to the method of filing. Um, under the old system, it's acceptable either to file on paper through the secretary's office or to file directly electronically into the electronic comment filing system. Under the new rule, electronic filing is mandatory. Ex parte notices must be filed electronically up on ECFS. If a party can demonstrate hardship of some kind, then we do allow for a narrow exception for parties unable to comply, but they must substantiate the reason why they can't comply at the time that they file. This, this is really exciting because you may know that um, our uh, electronic comment filing system was upgraded uh, during this uh, chairmanship and it, it provides a lot of new functionalities that make searching records much more, much more easy. Uh, it's, a, it's a very reliable and robust system and requiring the electronic filing, which most filers do anyway, will just increase the utility of that tool and increase the speed with which new information is available to the staff and to outside parties. We also took a look uh, in the proceeding at the specific format for filings. Uh, the old rule didn't address uh, what types of documents could be electronically filed. Under the new rule, ex parte notices should be in their native format. For example, if a document was created in Word, it should be filed in Word. If it was created in Excel, it should be filed in Excel. Uh, and if it's, if it's an Adobe Acrobat type PDF document, it's fine to file it as such so long as it's searchable. The reason for this is to make access to information in the docket more searchable, more manageable, more manipulable by, by anyone who is trying to analyze um, information in a docket is particularly a problem in our uh, large proceedings where we get many, many filings. When they're not machine searchable, it, uh, it adds a lot of time 
to uh, commission staff or to outside parties trying to do their analysis. So under the new rule, filings should be in their native formats. This raises a concern, of course, with regard to the submission of confidential information. Um, under the old rule, a person wanting to file confidential information or information they didn't want to be disclosed generally to the public on our public filing system could comply with our Rule 0 0.459 regarding submission of information. So you file on paper with the Secretary's Office a, a, a request for confidential treatment and then your, your confidential filing. Under the new rule, uh, and keep in mind we're talking about mandatory electronic filing, you can still comply with the old rule, 0 0.459, but electronically you must file your request for confidential treatment and a redacted version of the document that you're filing. The confidential information can still be filed on paper with the Secretary's Office, so the protections for that information specifically um, have not been lessened at all by this new requirement. Well, that's a lot of extra stuff to do, you say. Well, to the extent it is, and I, I, don't, I don't think it is because many of us already um, include the names of the parties on the filing and already summarize information that was presented. Um, but to the extent there is an extra burden, we have extended the time for filing. Under the old rule, filings were due one business day after the day of the presentation. Now, the general rule is that ex parte notices are due by midnight on the second business day after the presentation. So for example, if someone makes an ex parte presentation today, assuming the rules were already in effect, which they're not, but if someone made an ex parte presentation today, the notice would be required to be filed by Tuesday midnight. This extra time, though, doesn't work so well during the sunshine period. Um, the old rule did not distinguish in the filing, the, the deadline for filing between regular time and the time after a sunshine notice has been released or a sunshine period. Because the sunshine period, by definition, is leading up to a commission decision, it's important that information be available to staff and to the public quickly. Therefore, we did not extend the time for filing ex parte notices during the uh, sunshine period. In fact, if an ex parte presentation is made the day that the sunshine notice is released, so for example, if someone makes a presentation right now and then the sunshine notice is released later today, the presentation is due at the end of one more business day, so by Monday midnight. During the sunshine period, the time for filing is more compressed. If a presentation that is permissible is made during the sunshine period, the notice is due the same day. This is important because, uh, as I was saying, information needs to be readily accessible, quickly accessible during the sunshine period. Um, and in order to accommodate the fact that new information is still sometimes presented during the sunshine period, we added an opportunity for reply. Under the old rule, replies to ex parte presentations were not permitted unless they fell within an exception to presentations made during the sunshine period. For example, um, presentations that are made at the request of commission staff are permissible during the sunshine period. Um, when otherwise they would not be. Under the new rule, replies are now allowed uh, without, a, an, uh, without having to fall themselves within a specific exception. The reason for that is that new information is being put in a record. Many of these proceedings are um, uh, controversial or um, have tremendous legal and policy consequences and after reviewing the record it seems that there really ought to be an opportunity for parties to reply to information that is filed even during the sunshine period. However, replies must be limited to the specific issues 
that are presented in the ex parte to which the reply responds. In other words, replies can't go over all the main points that a party has been making throughout the proceeding. They must be limited to responding to the new information that showed up in the ex parte to which they're replying. <clears throat> we also sought comment and took a look at enforcement of our ex parte rules. Um, and we, we sought comment on how to strengthen the Commission's enforcement of ex parte rules in general. Under the old rule, the General Counsel has authority to issue rulings on whether a violation has occurred. Under the new rule, the General Counsel retains that authority. In addition, the Enforcement Bureau now has delegated authority to levy forfeitures. We also sought comment on how to treat filings that are made on our new media sites. You may be familiar with some of the new media tools that the Commission has used recently um, in some of its proceedings. Uh, we've received many responses to postings. We've received um, information and uh, uh, comments with a small c on our uh, idea scale page and so forth. And to this day, we have taken a case-by-case -case approach to whether filings made via new media are considered part of the official record, and if so, what the mechanics of that are. After reviewing the record, we decided to keep with that approach. Uh, we'll continue to develop ways to make inclusion of this type of um, submission in more proceedings technically and practically possible, but we look forward to gaining more experience both internally and in working with the public before we try to craft any uh, any rules. So we'll continue to operate on a case-by-case -case basis, putting out public notices um, when we are going to address uh, filings on new media in a particular way. <coughs> Finally, in the notice of proposed rulemaking, we sought comment on whether ex parte notices should disclose the real party in interest, and if so, how. There was a, a, a lot of um, um, uh, filings on this topic in the, in the docket and um, frankly some concern that the Commission perhaps was um, going down a path that was unnecessary, that uh, information about the true party and interest such as for example the, um, the main drivers of a particular trade association or, or what have you that that information is either already out there, already publicly available, or that it could be difficult to um, keep it up to date to ensure that it continues to be accurate and so forth. But the Commission did determine in this order that it would serve the public interest to have some kind of disclosure requirement, but we left the uh, promulgation of rules to a further notice of proposed rulemaking. So we still have a further notice in the same docket which seeks comment on the range of proceedings to which some kind of disclosure rules should apply, what disclosure rules should apply, and, and uh, what disclosure rules should apply to different types of entities, and finally whether to require disclosure when information is already publicly available. So we look forward to reviewing the record in response to the further notice. When will the ex parte rule changes be effective? On June 1st. Uh, two of the rules are still pending approval from OMB due to their implications, um, that the implications that they have under the Paperwork Reduction Act. We are expecting to receive that approval such that all of the rules will become effective on June 1st together, but we will um, publish more information as we have it on the effective date of either all of the rules or the subset that don't require OMB approval. And we look forward to reading the record in response to the further notice. I encourage anyone who's interested to participate in that. Comments are due June 16th and replies July 18th. Thank you. I think we'll do Q&A at the end and now uh, Austin will introduce Bill Klein. Bill, do you want to get your, yourself set up? Right. Just two quick comments. Uh, thank you, Julie, on, on, on uh, 
the ex parte rules that the first is that there is a related change outside the narrow scope of the ex parte uh, rules that I wanted to mention, and that is that uh, for those of you who uh, schedule ex parte meetings, whether you work for the commission or, or come in from the outside, you'll know that before the sunshine period, that is an item which is going to be on a commission open meeting, uh, we put out a, a public notice to commence the sunshine uh, period. And we do that seven days before uh, the open meeting. That's under the Government of the Sunshine Act, a post-Watergate statute. Historically, we've done that around close of business. Uh, so those of you, particularly on, on items that have a lot of ex partes, you'll be trying to schedule your ex parte so that you can get out of the building by the time that you think the notice prohibiting that meeting uh, will come out. Uh, we didn't think that was the best approach. So uh, we have changed the rule for sunshine notices. The sunshine notices will be effective. They'll still be released uh, on the, uh, the day, the week one week before, so uh, this month's meeting is on the 12th, yesterday, the 5th, the notice was released, but they will be effective at midnight that day. Uh, so those of you who enjoy late night meetings, dinner meetings, this is your opportunity to continue the conversation right up to midnight. Um, enforcement, Julie talked about the new enforcement rules. I, I want to emphasize uh, as general counsel, which uh, I have primary responsibility for enforcing the rules, that we view these amendments as part of an overall effort to improve our ex parte processes, and that includes enhanced enforcement, uh, strengthened enforcement. Uh, I, I, I don't know uh, the true state of past compliance, because if, if I knew about noncompliance, I'd do something. I think there, there is a general perception that uh, under the old rules, uh, the reporting requirements were not always diligently followed. And uh, what the message we're trying to send by improving the rules, by strengthening the reporting requirements, by expanding the reporting requirements is that we are serious about this and uh, that will be accompanied by uh, a renewed focus on enforcement. So uh, with that cheery note, uh, Bill Klein uh, uh, from our Consumer Government Affairs Bureau will talk about the filing and docketing requirements of the new rules. Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, it's nice to see some familiar faces, and I see some new ones as well, so welcome. Uh, before I start, I want to actually uh, thank the Office of General Counsel. This, as Julie mentioned, these two orders have come in tandem all the way along. Uh, Richard Welsh actually did the MPRM, and reached out to folks to coordinate it. Uh, Ajit Piet, P.A. Pai, uh, worked on the report and order. And so we're really glad that these are going into effect. Many of the changes are internal to our processes. Some of them will affect you, and I'd like to cover some of those at least right now. Uh, it's kind of funny that when we started this process, Mary Beth Richards, when she was talking about the reform, she got a laugh. I sent her a. Uh, a memo that I'd sent to her in 2002 asking for some of these changes and here we are today. Uh, the first thing is, let's see, does this work correctly? Perfect. Um, these changes to this docket are the first ones that have really occurred to docket management since the passage of FOIA and privacy in the mid-70s. Many of these uh, rules were designed from when there was paper-based documents and dockets. We had two copies, red and blue, and you had to come to the reference center to get it. Um, we've come a long way since then, and now these rules for uh, taking some uh, efficiencies and all will finally take place. It, they are designed actually to, as Austin said, to provide more transparency. Um, Part of it is to expand the docketing process to docket what we refer to, and some of you know the term, docketing of non-docketed uh, proceedings. It covers a gamut of things. Most of them are those items that are issued by a public notice or a report and ask for public comment and replies. Uh, many of those who have been in paper, if you wanted to see it, you came here to see it. Uh, it is our hope and our desire to work with the bureaus and offices to put these on ECFS so that um, you can view them at home. 
similar to the things, the changes on ex parte requiring electronic filing so that you can actually see the oral ex parte summary online. We've actually had a series of meetings with the uh, bureaus and offices identifying uh, areas for which we can expand the, uh, the docket process. Some of them are listed in the order. Um, some of them deal with things such as poll attachments. CPNI has already, actually since this order started, has already been put to an electronic format. But we're also talking about um, things such as uh, petitions for cable relief, special relief, of other things like OTAR uh, complaints and market dispute resolutions so that these things even if uh, at least in some of the cases where there's a market dispute resolution so that you can't comment but certainly to provide the transparency so that it's available on ECFS for your access. Um, we are uh, now that the rules are going to affect on June 1st we're going to work diligently with the bureaus and offices to try to find any other areas for which we can provide transparency to these types of proceedings. One of the changes you'll notice is you can save a tree. File electronically in ECFS, but more importantly, if you have to file in paper, the rules have changed to an original and a copy. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do without 14 copies around here, but uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure some of the offices will get by without that. The intent, though, is for you to file on ECFS. And uh, hopefully, uh, you'll take advantage of those the, the changes that uh, that we're going to bring forward. The last major change, or one of the other major changes, is service rules. This section has required us for years. If we're performing service, and one of my favorite is 9645, started out dealing with. Uh, uh, it's it's a it's an old common carrier proceeding. When we provide service, we literally print out 200 copies, take them, send them to the mail room, have them stamped. That stamped copy that comes back is then scanned in to provide service. We've changed that finally, and now uh, service for more than 20 people, we will do. We will create some method on the web. Uh, we will send out one more public notice to all of the people that are on the mailing list, instructing them how to uh, come here to our website, establish an RSS feed, or find or bookmark the proceeding and come and get it, um, rather than us printing all these documents and sending all, the, all of it by postage. Um, the change on electronic notification also allows us to do uh, something that's near and dear to a lot of our uh, hearts here. For years, when, to perform services, I mentioned we print out copies of documents that were electronically released from eDocs, but we had to in order to get the stamp uh, performed. Now we're going to work. Uh, in, in the agency to electronically transfer when documents are released that affect a docket from eDocs to ECFS without all of the paper being printed and scanned back into an electronic format. Um, we don't have a specific time frame. It is uh, an IT effort, but it's not a huge level of effort. We hope that, uh, that this year you're, you're going to see those changes happen meaning that you'll no longer see scanned copies of our releases of orders, public notices, news releases, those types of documents, and they'll be electronic in the record so that you can keyword search it. My favorite is terminating proceedings, stale proceedings, old proceedings. We have a host of them. Uh, they're dormant. They've not had a comment for more than five or six years. There are more than 3,500 open proceedings before the commission. And it's that way because, uh, you know, the, the initiatives of the agency move forward and certain proceedings get forgotten. Uh, and this is an effort to, excuse me, this is an effort to identify those proceedings create a non-docketed 
uh, proceeding, put the list out for public comment, and uh, advise you of our intent to terminate those proceedings. That does not mean that these proceedings disappear from ECFS. What it means is we will stop receiving comments to those proceedings and they will always be available for your research. It just simply means that it's time to move on, let's close them and not allow any additional comment to those and move on. Next steps. There are, as you, as you know, lots of paper that are filed for various purposes, waivers, petitions for clarification of rules, a whole host of, of things. We, uh, we are working now that these rules are going to go to, into effect on June 1st with the bureaus and offices to identify additional places where we can stop uh, sending paper in here, have it done electronically, and um, stay tuned. Uh, there'll be more coming to you. There'll be workshops, public notices, announcements, and things of that nature to alert you as we go forward. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Bill. Um, these proceedings have been a lot of fun to work on because they've been very collaborative. The ex parte proceeding, for example, started off with a workshop uh, in this room where uh, we brought in uh, outside practitioners to, to give us their thoughts on, on what direction uh, we might take the proceeding. Uh, the procedures uh, item was intensely collaborative uh, with CGB and, and with all the bureaus and offices to figure out how we collectively could improve the place. Um, Part of that uh, has been collaboration on today's uh, presentations. I just want to thank uh, the FCBA uh, for co-hosting this with us, and uh, I want to thank uh, CGB and the OMD and the IT staff uh, for supporting uh, today's presentation, uh, which leads us to the, if you will, the FCBA portion of today's program. Uh, you've heard from the FCC uh, presenting to you uh, now we want to give uh, practitioners, uh, the public, a chance to ask questions of us. Um, that will be done in three ways, I think. Uh, first, uh, our, our two practitioner panelists uh, closest to me, David Solomon of Wilkinson Barker now, our um, longtime, uh, highly respected uh, FCC attorney, and deputy general counsel, first head of the uh, remolded Enforcement Bureau uh, and uh, now a leading uh, member of the Communications Bar. Uh, Howard Weiss uh, at the end of the table of uh, Fletcher Hilden Hildreth, uh, a media and uh, uh, cable lawyer, uh, uh, extensive uh, practical experience, also extensively involved in FCBA uh, and, and public service uh, and uh, another pillar of of the outside um, uh, support organization that we rely on. Um, they will ask questions of, uh, of Julie and Bill. Um, I may or may not get some myself. I, uh, and that's uh, step one. Step two is I think there will be an opportunity for you here in the room to ask questions. And step three, uh, we are going to attempt to take questions online from those who are, are, are watching on the internet. And uh, is there information on how to do that? Uh, if, if you are out there and have questions, uh, email them. And Ann Bushmiller is right here to take them. And then I'll pass them on to our, our panelists. So uh, David and Howard. So I hope it's OK. It's listening to the presentations, I think I'm going to add a step zero or pre one, which is just a story, it's sort of observation leapt to my mind as I was listening to them, which is, um, just how far the Commission has come technologically in terms of transparency. So I came here to the General Counsel's Office in 1987, and one of the first things I worked on, obviously I won't talk about the internal details of it, because the General Counsel's right here and I have to be careful, but um, I was asked to do an investigation, asked by the Chairman to do an investigation of how the following thing happened, which was the Commission had in a rulemaking order, it relied on something that somebody submitted that nobody had ever heard of. And it wasn't in the record in those binders that Bill was talking about and 
So we were looking into how that happened. And the way it happened, because this is how written ex party presentations were done then, somebody had simply brought to the staff attorney an interesting paper, and the staff attorney had read it and had written it into the order and cited it and just kind of assumed it was in the record. So we had this whole thing which seemed like fancy new procedures then, which was the secretary put out once or twice a week starting then a public notice that listed all the permit but disclose ex party presentations that were made and there were internal training sessions about how if you're a staff attorney and somebody comes to you and gives you a piece of paper you have to send it to the secretary so the secretary can put it on this public notice and now it just sort of all happens and you sit in your office as an attorney and you want to see what someone's filed and you go into ECFS and it's there and with these rules even more will be there so it's really amazing how much has changed in the five years since 1987 um, so I want to start with a couple of questions about enforcement and just try to understand how sort of the interrelationship between the general counsel's office and the enforcement bureau will work and particularly the first question is um, so it says OGC decides whether something is an ex parte presentation is a violation and then if it concludes there's a problem it can send it to the enforcement bureau for enforcement action but in those cases will OGC have art will they issue a ruling so they'll say we have found there's um, a, vi a violation and then there's an NAL and sort of the person responding to the NAL has to disagree with OGC's conclusion or it will be sort of OGC will say looks like there's a problem so we'll refer it to the Enforcement Bureau. David, I, I think that what's most likely to happen is that um, if, if OGC refers a matter to the Enforcement Bureau, it'll be an internal informal referral say, you know, we think you should, we think you should look into this and then the Enforcement Bureau will proceed, um, you know, as it normally does by looking at the matter and deciding how to proceed based on the merits. So there won't be a pre-decision that somehow you have to argue against? I don't think so. Good. Um, and if you don't decide to refer to the Enforcement Bureau, what kinds of things might OGC do um, when it's ruling on them? Well, we retained our, our current rule, which, which says that OGC can rule on it, but we have all the existing remedies available to us. Um, you know, we can, um, we, we can prevent a party from further participation in a proceeding. Um, we we could we could um, look at other remedies if appropriate, but I would say at that time, um, if the enforcement bureau has decided not to not to pursue it, I'm sure that the general counsel's office would take that into account in deciding how serious, if any, a remedy is appropriate. Thank you, Austin and Julie and Bill. Appreciate it. Appreciate your including us. Um, question I had about the um, termination of dormant uh, rulemaking proceedings this has happened I think a number of times at the Commission and uh, one I'm particularly familiar with uh, five to ten years ago a practitioner filed a, a petition for rulemaking to get rid of the public uh, inspection file requirement <laughs> it didn't it wasn't greeted with a great deal of enthusiasm at the Commission but at some point the Commission did open up a rulemaking to uh, ask for comments and I think comments were filed, if I'm not mistaken, in reply comments. And um, it's sat there ever since. Dormant, I guess, would be a good word to use for it. My, the question is, is that the kind of proceeding that, the, uh, that might be uh, terminated? The, um, the language of the, uh, of the order says that in a docket in which no further action is required or contemplated, termination might be applied. Whereas if, if uh, a docket in which petitions addressing the merits are pending, termination would not be applied. I'm not sure which it comes under, you know, because it, there is a petition ad uh, addressing the merits which is still pending because it's never been rejected or accepted. Uh, that's a really good question and it's probably one of those that we're going to put on the list. Uh, the bottom line is that many of these that we found and it's over a thousand let's put it that way have not had a comment since 2005 or back um, that means that the the people who uh, would have acted on it have moved on retired uh, got a new job went to private practice um, and people that are here now have no knowledge of of the existence of it it's not really a, a uh, 
Uh, and in those cases, if it was an RM number, then that means we simply did that to provide uh, transparency in paper in those days to get it into ECFS so that people could see it. So it would go on notice as, as a possible victim of termination, but there'd be an opportunity for people to, to uh, object to that. Uh, how are we intend to make the list machine readable? You, can, you should be able to sort it um, and be able to look at the filings that are in those dockets uh, uh, when we provide it. So just to follow up on Howard's question, if, if let's say something's on the list, the commission issued an NPRM six years ago and hasn't acted on it, so there have been no comments in the last five years. If somebody cares about that and sees it on the list, you would file a petition for reconsideration then of your action? or how that, you, that, how That's, you do that's it? right, David. I, I, I think that's how it would work. and. Um, We'll have some people check that there are some new rules that deal with petitions for reconsideration that I would have you review as well. Um, and that means that just saying, please don't uh, terminate that proceeding, it's got to be more to the substance of why and, and why not. But does the, I guess the question is sort of, does the staff get to say, I guess it does, if the commission issued a rulemaking five years ago and the commission hasn't acted, the staff can say we're done. It doesn't have to be the commission that says we're done. Oh, that's how we're going to approach it, and then people can issue a uh, petition for reconsideration, and I'm sure that people above my pay grade will make a decision on those. Let me just address that. Yes, that it, the commission has ruled on that by adopting the or the orders that that uh, when the commission uh, adopted uh, these rulemakings uh, in, in February, one of the things it did is authorize. Uh, the Consumer and Government Affairs Bureau to perform this function, but it has to be done on, uh, through notice and comment, uh, and that's the process that Bill described. Well, and, and get to Howard's point also that we did do this. Uh, you may recall, because well, I worked with General Counsel <laughs> at the time, um, in the late 90s, we went through a process of doing a notice and comment, a memorandum of opinion, an order, and, and went through this to terminate about four or 500, 600 or so, it seems to me, uh, right before we moved to this building. Yeah, and the reality is probably that there might be some like Howard's that most people, if you haven't spoken up in five years, probably don't care that much, right? right? Um, because sometimes we members of the bar tend to come in and ask about things. <laughs> Um, let me ask a question about status inquiries. This relates to something that's in the orders, but in the order, but again relates to sort of the relationship between the general counsel and other parts of the commission. Um, so the order, the ex parte order, says that staff attorney in a bureau, when you come in and you kind of you think you're doing a status inquiry or you ask if what you just did was a status inquiry, if the person in the bureau says no, that wasn't that went beyond a status inquiry, you now need to do a present uh, written uh, ex parte summary. If you disagree with them, can you sort of still go to the general counsel's office to sort of get another ruling and to try to work it out, or is that sort of the, essentially the final word? Well, you, outside parties are free to call the general counsel's office, and, and uh, um, I mean, under the procedures, if the if the staff attorney believes that an ex parte should have been filed, or maybe an ex parte was filed but is deficient under the new rules, the staff attorney should bring that to the general counsel's office. So we will be looped in at that point anyway um, and, and can discuss it. But at the end of the day, the burden is on the outside parties to be in compliance with the ex parte rules. So um, I, I don't think that there is a, um, a last word on the subject at the point of discussing discussing the matter between the staff and the party who uh, the staff believes should have filed, but at the same time, um, OGC is going to pursue um, um, any staff referrals for lacking or deficient violations and will refer to EB as appropriate. Can I just reinforce that? Uh, Barbara has been uh, a loyal commission alumna and a uh, loyal viewer of our, of our webcast today, uh, asked exactly that question. Um, uh, her question was, if staff attorney here at the commission uh, believes an ex parte notice to be inadequate, may he, she refer that to OGC or the Enforcement Bureau for further action? And uh, just to, to hit the point uh, unequivocally, uh, yes. Um, in, in the ordinary course, um, if it is 
uh, an isolated uh, inadequacy in a, uh, in a report, an ex parte notice. Um, my practice, I think the standard practice is for the attorney, the, it doesn't have to be an attorney, it can, it can be uh, any member of the staff of the commission who is at an ex parte presentation uh, to contact the presenter who submitted the notice and say, you know, I remember that we talked about this and I didn't see it in the notice. Uh, can you please say more about that? And in my experience, I have never in, I think I've been at the commission five years in, in all now, uh, never had any resistance uh, in filing that. The, uh, in, again, in my experience, uh, the presenter is always willing and quick in, uh, in providing the full disclosure. Um, if it seems to be uh, a willful instance of noncompliance or uh, if, if uh, repeated noncompliance is an issue, um, the staff attorney, uh, the staff member um, is entirely free and encouraged uh, uh, to contact the general counsel's office, which is the point of contact for ex parte enforcement. Um, and uh, refer the matter to us and we'll take it for, from there and uh, working with EB if a forfeiture may be appropriate, uh, impose appropriate sanctions or determine that no sanctions are appropriate. So I take it if there are sort of minor things, uh, th let me state that. But so the commission had an order recently that was under the existing rules that leaving aside the particular facts, um, affirmed the general counsel's office and said enforcement action wasn't appropriate and sort of at a high level it was sort of, I think, sending a signal, sort of make important things important that sort of, um, so that your efforts will focus more if there's some sort of serious or systematic kind of violation as opposed to, you know, somebody makes a technical error for the first time and you call them and they immediately fix it. That doesn't get referred typically to the Enforcement Bureau under this regime. Right. We, we absolutely do not view the ex parte rules as a, a trap for them where they are, they are not the Commission's equivalent of, of a speed camera. Um, we are uh, here in order to get uh, the substance on the record and uh, in, you know, probably 95 times out of 100, the best way to do that is for the presentee to contact the presenter and say, please correct this deficiency. And that's also a learning experience for the presenter. Uh, in those uh, predictably rare instances uh, where uh, there is something other than a, a good faith effort at compliance uh, at issue, you know, absolutely the staff should refer that to uh, the general counsel's office for enforcement. And the only other thing I'll add is that we frown upon the uh, attempt of some parties to use the ex parte process as a strategic weapon uh, on the merits of a proceeding. Um, you know, a uh, an allegation of ex parte violations that is made in something less than good faith would itself be inconsistent with our rules. And that's consistent with uh, the, the bar rules, for example, the, uh, the standards of professional conduct where you can't use uh, uh, compliance with the professional requirements as a strategic weapon in, in your litigation. And th this is the same idea. Um, good faith allegations of noncompliance, absolutely please bring them to us. Uh, but we don't want people to confuse ex parte compliance with the merits of their proceeding. Um, this is a question that I gather from our, our discussions is, is uh, perhaps better directed to the video division, but still, I still like to ask it because it's very important to a broadcast practitioner. Last week, the, um, the video division issued a, uh, a release that docketed an assignment application. Um, and in the release, it, 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 it issued a notice uh, to anyone in that case inviting participation by all parties and providing detailed explanation of how to file. Um, I had thought that the uh, docketing of proceedings would, would just involve a, you know, electronic list of, of applications that were, uh, that were uh, docketed. Um, it's true that the, the, the report and order says that, that any um, um, assignment application or renewal application that, is, that has been designated or, or that has uh, been petitioned to deny, excuse me, will require a docket number. But I guess I hadn't contemplated there would be such a, a comprehensive 
notice that it was docketed, and this was done before the rules were became effective. But and the reason for the question is is that it, it opens up what I, what a lot of broadcast practitioners would would consider a, a Pandora's box because it's going to attract a for an assignment application it's going to attract a lot more attention than under the current procedures. You're going to have people filing from all over the country. Um, the way it works now, you know, you just see an assignment application, a list of applications in the releases every day. You don't you don't see this 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 large notice, uh, uh, and I just wonder whether that's going to be standard procedure by the bureaus, if if you know. Uh, I don't. You know, I've been here 20 years, and uh, I know that in areas with media bureau, I have my limitations of what I can say. But I do know that they also did one recently on an audio assignment, as, as I recall. It wasn't too long ago. And I think they're trying to use this process. There's, there was nothing really that stopped us from docketing, non-docketing proceedings before. It was discretionary. It was discretionary. We've done a lot of assignments and transfers of control and control over the years, lots of them. Um, I think this is really their effort to try to provide the transparency that Austin was talking about in certain areas so that to stimulate public participation. So I think you're right. I think your, your assumption is correct that it is intended to get beyond the Washington metropolitan area on things that affect uh, the general public. I mean, what it's going to do is it's going to loop into the proceeding a lot of people who don't have standing, um, you know, and who wouldn't, wouldn't have filed under the old rules because they, it's true, they, they might not have been aware that you have to file a local public notice of, of filing the assignment application. But it, again, it's just local. so. I mean, I guess the question is, if that's going to be standard operating procedure, then we, we sort of need to know about that. Um, I, I that's, that really changes the, the nature of the pool of possible opponents. I, I want to assure you and, and the folks in the FCBA that uh, there are a lot more of conversations with our colleagues in the other bureaus and offices to talk about issues of this, public forums, uh, methods of communication of processes, uh, this one w occurred a little before the gate, but uh, we're encouraged by that, quite frankly. Thank you, Bill. Why don't we open up the floor for questions? People have questions? Are you talking about the applications and the uh, uh, oppositions to petitions, petitions to deny, and things of that nature? We've had some general conversations before the order came out with the, some of the bureaus and offices. We're not sure. Uh, we think these rules provide us the flexibility to, uh, to do those things, to absolutely do those things. And, uh, and we intend to uh, have those conversations internally, see if we can expand the use of it. Question, I oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the question was on the filing of indecency complaints to the commission. Is there some way of making those also available uh, using these rules? Uh, that is my other hat that I do of processing and helping with the procedures and the processes of complaints and inquiries. And uh, there are, in those cases, bigger issues that I'm more concerned about with privacy and protecting protecting people's privacy is a big thing of what we do here. And we only keep, for instance, complaints and inquiries for three years. And we only keep them for the three years because that's all the period of time I want to protect the privacy and then move them on from there. Uh, I can't answer your question. I think that there is an, an, an effort here at the commission. There's a new executive order on customer service uh, that was released on the 27th that lends itself maybe to some changes, but not immediately. Not, not as part of these rules, anyways. Joel, are you doing microphone? 
Um, I think this is for Julie. Um, what distinctions are there currently, or as of June 1st, in the rules between meetings that are requested by an outside party and meetings that are requested by commission staff? Thanks, Lauren. Unless it involves the sunshine period, there's no distinction. So outside the sunshine period, um, oral ex partes that are made at the request of staff are treated exactly the same way as oral ex partes that are made at the request of the presenting party. During the sunshine period, uh, and, and we get a lot of questions about this, during the sunshine period, the general rule is that ex parte presentations are not permitted at all. One of the exceptions to that prohibition is for presentations that are made at the request of commission staff. So that exception will continue in the new version of the rules, but with the different um, time for filing requirements must now be filed on, this, on the same day and the opportunity for reply. But otherwise, there's no change to how we treat um, presentations that are requested by staff versus those that are made at the initiative of the presenting party. Just a, a follow-up question on that, Julia. C can, can an outside party solicit a, a commission staffer to solicit a, a presentation <laughs> during the sunshine period? The, the long answer to that is we discourage ex parte presentations during the sunshine period, which is meant in part to be a period of repose for the commissioners to, uh, and, their, and their staffs to decide how they want to um, vote on a particular matter. The short answer is yes, uh, because uh, it is not an ex parte presentation to call a staff member and ask whether the staff member would like to have a conversation about something. But in all seriousness, we do discourage um, ex partes during sunshine because it is, it is difficult to keep up with all the filings and uh, you know, at some point we have to put these orders to bed and, and get people to decisions. So the exceptions exist because there are times when new information or uh, new arguments come to light or important issues arise uh, towards the end of a proceeding, and we need to accommodate that, but we, we try to keep it to a minimum. Um, I just interject a, a, a particular caution there. Um, an ex parte proceeding is a, a presentation is a pre presentation on the merits. So uh, although it would be okay to say we have some new information bearing on issue X, um, uh, would you like to hear it? Um, I, I wouldn't encourage that, but it, it's technically permissible. Uh, it is a violation of the sunshine period to say we have new information showing that 95% of the time we're correct. Uh, would, would you like it? Uh, you can't do that because your question contains the presentation, uh, which is prohibited. I also have uh, another online uh, question, uh, and this one is for Bill. Um, it comes from David Tretzky. Uh, if, uh, if a proceeding has been dormant but for ex parte presentations, so the comment period is long over, the only uh, recent submissions are ex parte comments, uh, will that be considered a dormant proceeding or an active proceeding? Uh, our current list at this point has been a period in time for which there's been no comment, ex parte or otherwise. Um, that's going to be our first crack at this. And then after uh, some success, we'll get our bearing and we'll come forward. And then if it's only ex parte presentations that are going in or as, as uh, you know, the, 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 the email campaigns or otherwise, then we will probably try to, tar to target those later on. But right now, the initial thought is pick a period in time, go back, and if there, for those that have had no comment, go forward. I have a question about the um, the native format filing requirement. So you said that um, PDFs are okay to use in some circumstances, and I think it's a general practice to, for instance, PDF um, Word documents to file them. Is that going to be acceptable? So long as the P so long as the PDF in its final filed form 
is machine readable and searchable. So for example, sometimes, and I, I can't speak to the technicalities, maybe Bill can, but sometimes you get a PDF that's really just a picture of your document. And the, the, if you go to the search box and type in a word, even if the word appears on the page, the machine doesn't, the computer doesn't recognize it. But if, you, um, if you've been working on a Word document, you've got lots of people who've been working on it, you want to make sure that all the internal changes and such are scrubbed away before you file, you can PDF it. And I believe in that circumstance, the PDF will be machine readable. But Bill, if you'd like to elaborate that on, please it, do. It is, it is a frequent uh, question that we receive also. The technical term is, is PDF image plus text. And it basically is, is a picture of it but the text sits on top of an OCR version. This agency, and, and while we were all doing DTV in 2009, spent a huge amount of resources converting the entire database of ECFS to image plus text files, just for the purposes of using Google Search Appliance or others for keyword search. It's, it's, it's important, and that's what, we, that's what uh, Julie's speaking of. Just to follow up, so oh, this is on. Um, Sometimes people PDF things like Excel spreadsheets. Is that not going to be acceptable now, or what's the differentiation well, the, between? Even even if if you convert to a uh, PDF for an Excel, you can still uh, make it image plus text, so those cells can be read. Right. So that's is that's, the, that's the term. So the only requirement is that the, the machine readable. It's machine readable is the requirement. That's that's right. the requirement. As a follow up to that one, is the enforcement going to be similar? if there's a non-searchable document as it is if it's not a specific filing or the parties aren't um, listed in there? I think all that, would, that would be a violation um, that would be treated like any other. And you know, as Austin explained, I could see the staff attorney calling to um, ask the presenter to review the rules and see if the information can be refiled. In your order, was there guidance on the specificity of the citation? Do you have to reference a page or paragraph? Is it enough to refer generally to a reply that might be 100 pages long? What sort of uh, specificity does a filer have to provide? The order says page or paragraph. So that, you know, we, we considered this for a while because we obviously are trying to balance the, uh, the usefulness of the ex parte filing versus the burden on the presenter to have to uh, do more work to make the filing comport with the rules. So it, it is page or paragraph. Uh, this is a question for Julie. Are you going to do a um, plain English compliance guide for ACBO? Of course. Seriously, uh, it, we will be doing a small entity compliance guide, which will, um, you know, the, 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 I think the underlying purpose of the compliance guides is to make sure that small entities um, understand how any commission rules apply to them. In this case, there's no distinction in our rules between small entities and others. Uh, so this will be a useful guide uh, for anyone who just wants a, um, a, a quick read on how to comply with the rules. And that will be made available on our website um, together with um, the information that today's presentation, the orders themselves, the new rules, information on the effective date of the rules, et cetera. I have a Another online question uh, from Michael Richards uh, and Julie. I think this is for you. Uh, in the situation where the commission receives a non-compliant submission, um, which could be a uh, a person who's not familiar, you know, non-lawyer or otherwise, uh, not familiar with our rules, um, and I, I, I think that uh, Mr. Richards also uh, means if it is not filed properly. So it may be if it's mailed when it when it should have been. Uh, delivered electronically, um, how would the commission respond to that? I think we would uh, we would respond by uh, contacting the filer, making them aware of our rules, um, and and uh, um, assisting them in both understanding how to comply and with the mechanics of complying. Um, I know in the past, 
in some instances where the filer is obviously not a um, frequent participant in FCC proceedings, maybe it's one of our dockets that's of very broad interest, such as you know DTV transition was. Um, on occasion, staff could place the document into uh, the record on behalf of the filer and let the filer know that that's happening. But I think the default rule will be that the staff will contact the filer, educate them about the rules, and assist them in getting the document properly filed. Uh, what was the nature of the, uh, of the part that's being held up at OMB? The, I guess it's 1.1206B. 1.1206B and one part of 1.1208. 1.1206B contains most of the requirements we've been talking about, the content of notices for oral ex parte presentations and the filing requirements. So there were, there were a number of other um, minor cleanup amendments that were made to the old ex parte rules that we haven't really talked about today. Those will go into effect regardless of, of whether OMB um, acts on these other rules or not. The 1.1208 uh, change that awaits OMB approval has to do with um, requiring parties in restricted proceedings who make presentations that are not ex parte to file a summary. Uh, in other words, if a proceeding is designated as restricted, ex parte presentations are not permitted. You have to um, invite all the parties to the presentation, give them an opportunity to be present. Um, if a meeting like that does happen, there's now a formal obligation to file a summary. So that uh, rule change also awaits OMB approval. Uh, Bill, I have uh, a question for you uh, from Jean Cadu, uh, I believe it is. Um, does the machine the requirement of machine readable filing does that apply only to ex parte submissions or is that true for all filings as well? That's for all filings. If you go to ECFS and look at the document type list, it, it lists those that we've spoke of here as document types. And you know, as as Austin said, Julie and I talked when they were doing the rules, so we were very certain of of what we meant by it. But it it does mean uh, uh, machine readable and and if it's a word document just so that you know that conversion occurs within the within part of ecfs to make it a machine readable pdf and so uh, the the normal document types are are available to you about what the significance uh, for dormant proceedings that the commission is uh, that you're going to consider terminating what would be the significance of uh, if any of the parties have gone for mandamus at the court even though they might not have filed anything recently at the FCC other than perhaps an ex parte well, that's a really good question and I don't think I've actually thought of that one <laughs> well, <laughs> Well, no, I see your question. Yes, it, it could happen, I suppose. Um, I would be surprised if anyone went for mandamus without first filing something in the proceeding here. It would seem litigators out there. Uh, before going to the court asking for mandamus, it would be uh, courteous and smart to remind us of uh, the proceeding and let us try to fix it. Uh, because if you don't give us that chance, the court will. So you can, you can save some money. Um, uh, if it if it were to happen uh, that a party went to court without to, without coming here, I, I suppose that there's nothing in our docket, uh, we would not uh, recognize it as a proceeding in which parties were interested. Uh, it would go on the public notice, uh, and I would hope that the person who is so interested they're filing a mandamus petition would read the public notice and tell us no, it, it's alive. Could I follow up on the, the one, uh, Julie, the, the point you made about a restricted proceeding and meetings of, of parties uh, from both sides? One of the problems that comes up all the time is where you, you set up a meeting with someone at the commission and you invite the uh, parties on the other side and their response is, no, uh, I'm not coming. And it, it sort of gives them the power to block the, uh, the meeting. Um, is, it, is it fair to say that uh, if, if they don't come, then the meeting can't be held? Uh, I 
I don't believe that's correct. I believe that the rule is that parties have to have an opportunity to be present. So if they've received the invitation and have not have chosen not to accept it, that doesn't mean they didn't have an opportunity to come. They no, did. They just declined. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. And it's not ex parte. Okay. Um, Thank you. Why don't we take Why don't we take one more question and then we, we reach our time? Okay. Very quickly. Um, in terms of courtesy copies, I don't know if I heard um, if that was going to still what, what uh, you know what the procedure is going to be with that and and given that. Um, there could be errors now and people second-guessing filings. Um, in terms of remedies to go back outside of the traditional uh, you know, approaches now, uh, is there going to be anything on ECFS that allows uh, better, I don't know, uh, the uh, party's uh, better chance to rescind or, or uh, take back um, filing? I'll let Bill take the second half of that. Um, um, and on the, on the first, well, could you remind me of the first part, please? <laughs> What was the first half? Um, courtesy copies. Courtesy copies, and, and thank you. Um, it's actually now codified in the rules uh, that uh, the ex parte should be sent by email to all the commission commissioners, commission staff who were present at the meeting. And we do appreciate those, so thank you for sending them. On the, uh, on the review for ECFS, when we launched the new version in October, November of 2009, we built in there a review process. Uh, once you've listed either the dockets or the documents that you want to submit and you press submit it actually gives you another shot and says please make sure that this is what you want to submit and you press the button it's gone and there I cannot once it comes in we've given given you the ability that you can check the status of where it is with the uh, a, a received uh, pending uh, disseminated and so forth uh, and posted to the record uh, I would highly recommend that if you've made a filing an error you follow the procedures that are outlined and that is send an email to the office secretary ECFS help and please uh, delete this filing and resubmit and that's how it works we have reached our time. The, the last time I did an FCBA event on ex parte rules at the end of our panel, I think David was, was there, the moderator said, uh, when we come back from a short break, we'll get to the interesting part of the program. And uh, I, I hope you don't share that view because there is no second half to this one. Um, thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you uh, for coming, uh, those who did view online, and it seems people did. So. Uh, Thank you very much for that as well. Um, we appreciate it there. Uh, for commission staff, there will be additional training on the new rules and, and requirements. Uh, and I, I hope that FCBA and, and others uh, will be doing additional work uh, with external parties as well. Thanks. <laughs>